Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this very nice workshop. Um, and so today I'll be telling you about some work uh, done uh, in collaboration with the following people. Uh, so the people I observe was a Polzak at Alberta, the original to Heidelberg, Tim Kim Lynn is currently my Polzak at Alberta. Chaka uh, Jan uh, is a Hong Yao student at IS at Chihuahua University in Beijing, and Will Richard Trampa is a uh, Montreal, and the work I'll be talking about today is recorded in these, uh, these papers. And so, uh, so this work, uh, this talk will be about uh, topological surface states, so surface states of 3D uh, topological insulators. We've heard a lot about those in the past couple days, and uh, there's not much of a need for uh, introduction to these systems. Uh, but the take that I would like to, to have on these systems in this talk is to view them as, as uh, platforms for uh, possible, possibly new types of quantum criticality. Okay, so we know that there's something sort of interesting or anomalous about the surface states in the sense that in the presence of the symmetries that protect the topological phase, uh, these states can only exist on the boundary of a higher dimensional system and not in a lattice model of the same dimensionality. Okay, so for instance, you cannot have a single direct fermion with a uh, time reversal and U1 particle conservation symmetry in a 2D lattice system. It has to exist on the boundary of the 3D system. Okay, so, so we know that we have these sort of anomalous uh, states, and so this begs the question, if we include interactions, okay, so, so far, you know, we, can, we know we can understand the physics of surface direct fermions without interactions, so now if we add interactions to the system, is this possible that these anomalous surface states can give rise to new types of uh, quantum phase transitions uh, that, in a sense, are possible because of this anomalous character? So in a sense, that we have model, uh, in quotes, boundary quantum critical phenomena that would be impossible or at least hard to realize in uh, both systems. So in this talk, I'll focus on a particular type of quantum criticality, which is a semi-metal uh, superconductor transition uh, on the surface of a 3D uh, topological insulator. And so this will be, uh, as I already mentioned, a system with, uh, which has an odd number of 2D direct fermions with a U1 particle number of conservation and the time reversal symmetries. Okay, so this is the outline of, of my talk. So First, I'll begin with a warm-up, which will be a review of a, uh, a sort of well-known phase transition, which is the Bose uh, superconductor transmitter uh, transition, which is sort of the, uh, one of the paradigmatic examples of the quantum phase transitions in, in two dimensions. And it's, 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 as we'll see, it's quite similar in spirit to the, the transition that will be the focus of this talk, uh, which is the Dirac fermion version of that. So it will be a Dirac fermion a superconductor to semi-metal in this case uh, transition. Okay, but as we'll see, there's an interesting twist in, in this, uh, this story from the presence of these direct fermions. And so as I said, the, the, the 3D topological insider has an odd number of direct fermions. So first I'll talk about uh, uh, the, the physics of the transition between a single direct fermion, which would be, for instance, uh, the case in you know, many of these uh, first generation uh, TI materials. And I'll, I'll argue that maybe there is relevance of this, this theoretical ideas that I'll talk about to uh, antimony tail ride. And then I'll move on to the next possible case, which is three direct cones and, uh, and their a possible platform, but in a very speculative uh, a way could be a, a Samarium hexaboride. Okay, so let's start with uh, the, uh, the superconductor insulator transition of bosons. So the, uh, the classical, uh, sort of classic setting to observe this transition uh, is the Gilgis injunction array. So uh, we have a system where we have a, a, an array of two dimensional array of superconducting islands. Uh, that are coupled via Cooper pair tunneling. Uh, okay, so we have a Hamiltonian that contains uh, essentially two terms. Uh, so we have a charging energy that uh, essentially wants to pin the number of, of Cooper pairs, uh, Ni, on a given uh, uh, island indexed by a lattice index I. And then there's a Josephson energy which uh, essentially favors the tunneling of Cooper pairs between uh, neighboring <coughs> islands. And what this term wants to do is to essentially establish phase coherence, so pin the phase or the relative phase between uh, two neighboring islands. Um, and, uh, but the number and the phase are conjugate variables, of course, and so this means that these two terms compete. And uh, if one term is, is much larger than the other, then we have two separate phases. So if this uh, charging energy is much greater than the Josephson energy, we have the uh, insulating phase where the, the phases, uh, Josephson phase is widely fluctuating. There's no phase order. And if the Josephson energy dominates, then of course the phase will lock and we'll have uh, overall phase coherence and we have a superconductor. Okay? And in between, there's an intervening quantum critical point that uh, appears at zero temperature at some critical value of this ratio of Ec over Ej. 
Okay, so this has been uh, observed e experimentally uh, a long time ago. So if you prepare a number of, of these arrays with, uh, you know, essentially various amounts of disorder, this will tune the resistance, which in turn will also tune the Gildersen coupling. And so you can actually observe this transition uh, as a function of temperature. You'll either get insulating behavior or a superconducting transition. And in fact, you can uh, map out the phase diagram uh, as a function of temperature and this uh, this ratio of, uh, of EC over EJ, which is the coupling constant in your problem, and then you can pin down what is the uh, universal value of this um, critical coupling. Okay, and more recently, there's been uh, observations of this uh, same transition uh, in uh, ultra cold uh, atomic systems on optic optical lattices, so essentially, realization of the Bose Hubbard model, uh, uh, which realizes this, this, uh, this transition. Okay, and so. Uh, so we can ask, okay, what is the sort of universal Lano Ginsberg description of this? Well, it's well known. So we have a, uh, a you know, bosonic complex uh, order parameter, order parameter, which is a coarse grain version of your Cooper pair field or your bosonic field for the ultra cold atom uh, realization. And so it's a quantum Lano Ginsberg uh, description. So there's a gradient term, and then there's a time derivative term, and we have a familiar Mexican hat potential. And we know that if uh, this uh, mass term for the scalar is less than zero, we have spontaneous symmetry breaking. And this mass term is simply your, uh, the distance from criticality. Okay, so uh, the reason this is interesting is because the quantum critical point is a sort of interesting uh, um, universality class. It's a strongly coupled quantum critical point. It's not uh, Gaussian. Uh, it's known as the O2 Wilson Fisher fixed point or the 3DXY universality class. And so there's interesting critical exponents and all the phenomenology that is, is associated with quantum phase transitions. Uh, and in particular, there's an emergent Lorentz invariance. So in the uh, Bose-Hubbard problem, this means you have to be at, uh, uh, at the particle hole uh, uh, symmetric point. Okay, so, um, so besides uh, things like critical exponents, there's other uh, interesting critical properties that uh, people have been interested in in the uh, past, uh, actually, uh, decades. Uh, and in particular, there's uh, this uh, uh, so-called quantum critical connectivity. Okay, so the idea is, um, can we see any signatures of critical behavior in the optical connectivity? So uh, zero momentum, uh, but finite frequency connectivity is a function of temperature. And it was shown very generally by uh, Damley and Sachdev in the 90s that uh, in two dimensions, uh, by scale invariance, this uh, connectivity will exhibit the following form. So we'll have the universal quantum of uh, conductance uh, times a universal scaling function of omega over uh, over T, that is really, you know, the entire scaling function is a, a universal property of the phase transition. Okay, it's material independent, provided that we are in the uh, quantum critical regime. Uh, and in particular, if you focus uh, on zero temperature, so really at the critical point, but as a function of, of frequency, um, then uh, you will probe essentially the omega uh, over T goes to infinity limit of the scaling function, which is some universal number. Um, and what this means is that if you're at zero temperature, or more generally, or, or rather in practice, if you're at uh, frequencies much greater than the temperature, then you should observe a, uh, a spectrally flat optical connectivity, okay? frequency independent uh, connectivity that essentially is a universal constant, very much like critical exponents. Okay? So we'd like to know for you know, a given universality class, what is this uh, universal constant? So for this transition that I've been talking about, this boson, uh, superconductor insulator uh, transition. Um, so it's a difficult problem. So there's no exact result. Uh, and there's actually a long history of trying to comp compute this number. After all, it's the response function uh, at finite frequency of a strongly correlated system that has no quasi-particles. Okay, so it's a very difficult problem. Uh, and uh, there's been lots of work on it. And only very recently, so in the past few years, uh, through a combination of a quantum Monte Carlo, large scale quantum Monte Carlo calculations, also techniques coming from particle physics, uh, holography, and the so-called conformal bootstrap have uh, these authors arrived at a, a uh, somewhat accurate value, uh, still not exact, but uh, at least some, some fairly accurate estimate of what this universal number could be. All right, so uh, now I'll switch gears and, and go into the meat of the talk, which is this uh, uh, superconductor semi-metal uh, transition of Dirac fermions. Okay, so now, uh, we are considering the uh, surface states of the 3D topological insulator. And so for simplicity, I'll begin with the uh, simplest possible case, uh, which is realized in the, you know, the, the bismuth selenide and other topological insulators we, we know and love, which is the case of a single uh, Dirac fermion. So we're in, in two dimensions on the surface. 
Uh, so we have a two component uh, Dirac fermion with spin up and spin down. And we'll be interested in looking at uh, pairing instabilities of this uh, Dirac fermion. Okay, so, um, so in fact, for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on the situation where the chemical <laughs> potential is at the Dirac point. So uh, uh, often is a, in as grown materials, it's not the case, but we've seen that in many cases, for instance, uh, from uh, Yuichi Ando's talk yesterday, that experimentally one can gate uh, the chemical potentials, and so we'll assume that the chemical potential is at uh, the Dirac point. Okay, and the reason for focusing on that is that there's actually something a bit interesting, which is the fact that the, uh, the density of states vanishes at the uh, 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 chemical potential equals zero, which means that uh, uh, instead of having the usual Cooper instability where for any uh, infinitesimal attractive interaction you become superconducting, uh, there's a non-zero TC. Uh, in this case, because the density of states vanishes, in fact, you need to exceed a certain threshold value of the attractive interaction to become superconducting. Okay, so what this means is that at zero temperature, as a function of the strength of the attractive interaction, there is a quantum critical point um, between the semi-metal where there's no pairing and the superconductor where we have pairing. So here we have pairing between up and down a fermion, so uh, uh, and there's no momentum dependence, so it's basically a nice wave superconductor, and this would open up a gap at the, uh, the direct point. Okay, so how would you realize this uh, in practice? So there's two possible routes to doing this. So one would be essentially borrowing the idea of the Josephson Junction Array. So this was suggested by these authors. So you would take a topological insulator, then you would deposit uh, a Josephson Junction Array on top of it. And what this means is that you would have the same, you know, EC charging energy and, uh, and Josephson energy with, where Cooper pairs can hop between neighboring islands. But now, because we have a gapless sea of, of uh, Dirac fermions, we can have pairs of Dirac electrons coming from the surface state tunneling onto this superconducting island and vice versa, which means that in our uh, Lana Ginsberg description, we have to add an extra term. Okay, so in our low energy theory, we have the degrees of freedom of the, the Josephson Junction array of the island. So we have the, the, the complex scalar order parameter, which is our Cooper pair field, coarse grain Cooper pair field. Um, but now we also have to put in the Dirac fermions. Okay, so we have the, uh, the non-attracting uh, Dirac cone. So here I'm, written, I'm writing it in a Lagrangian form uh, with a, a time derivative and then the, the usual Dirac Hamiltonian. Uh, but now there's also a term that accounts for the tunneling between the Dirac fermions on the surface state and onto the island. Okay, so in other words, there is a coupling between the uh, superconducting order parameter and the Dirac fermions. And if you do mean field theory on this, problem, you'll see that essentially you have this expected phase diagram that I just talked about. Okay, so um, that's the first possible route. There's another possible route, which would be, you know, what if the system intrinsically becomes superconducting because of electron phonon interactions? Okay, and so, uh, so there's an interesting paper uh, co published a couple of years ago where uh, the claim is that maybe they're observing something like this. So they, uh, so this was antimony tilride, which is perhaps lesser known, but still uh, a 3D, strong 3D topological insulator with a single Dirac cone on the surface. Uh, and uh, so they observe a resistive transition at a TC of about uh, nine Kelvin. Uh, and uh, also they measured the, the magnetic susceptibility and saw that if the field is uh, oriented parallel to the surface, there is very little uh, uh, magnetic response, but if the field is oriented perpendicular to the surface, then there is a much larger uh, diamagnetic susceptibility. Okay, so the claim is that maybe there is something like a Meissner screening on the surface, even though they're, they're very far from the, uh, from the Meissner limit. Okay, so this is still very uh, unclear whether this is really what is, what is happening. There's also uh, ES STM data uh, that's included in this paper, and they, they do seem to see, uh, you know, BCS coherence peaks, a gap in BCS coherence peaks in the uh, the local density of states, and uh, even though the gap seemed to vary quite a bit from point to point where they uh, uh, measure the, um, they do the SM measurement. Okay, so there seems to be some inhomogeneities in the gap, uh, but maybe there is something like intrinsic superconductivity on the surface of this system. All right, so, um, so these are two possible routes, so let's come back to what is the phenomenology of this, of this uh, superconductivity. So we have the, the gap S-wave superconductor, and we, if we focus on the quantum critical point, then things become pretty interesting. So it was shown by these authors that, uh, in fact, this quantum critical point has an emergent uh, space-time supersymmetry in two plus one dimension described by this so-called n equal two uh, Vesumino model. Okay, so the idea is that you start from this 
uh, uh, Lana Ginsburg, Lagrange, and I wrote down earlier with direct fermions and Cooper pairs, but now you go beyond mean field and try to study seriously uh, what are the, the properties of this quantum critical point, including fluctuations, and then what you find is that uh, you flow to some uh, fixed point that is distinct from both the Gaussian free uh, field fixed point and the Wilson-Fisher fixed point. And in fact, there's a finite uh, fermion boson coupling at the transition, which means that you're in a different universality class. Okay. Um, so as in the Wilson-Fisher case, we have a strongly coupled uh, quantum critical point, uh, but the, all the critical exponents are completely different. Um, so the first interesting uh, property, uh, besides the fact that we have a supersymmetric theory, is that from supersymmetry, we can actually compute these anomalous dimensions exactly. Okay, so these, the anomalous dimensions would be, for instance, you know, if you measure the spectral function of the fermions at the critical point in ARPES, you would see a power law behavior instead of a quasi-particle peak, and the power law of this uh, spectral function would be given by this uh, 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 anomalous dimension of the fermion eta psi. So because we have supersymmetry, both the boson and fermion anomalous dimensions are equal, and the nice thing is that from supersymmetry, actually, you can compute exactly this anomalous dimension. It's one-third, so it's very large, uh, uh, much greater than the uh, Wilson-Fisher anomalous dimension, uh, and it's known exactly, so that's, that's a nice result. You can try to compute other exponents, such as the correlation length exponents, so there things are a bit more uh, difficult. You, there's no exact result. You can do perturbative or normalization groups, so you can do it at one loop. We push the computation to three loop, and if you uh, do pi-day extrapolation of this three loop result, you can get a an approximate value for uh, the physical case of two plus one dimensions, and that seems pretty uh, close to the uh, a value obtained from this so-called conformal bootstrap approach, which is a non-perturbative but numerical approach to computing critical exponents. Okay, so it seems we have a pretty good handle on the critical exponents. What about other critical properties? So I mentioned the uh, optical connectivity. Okay, so again, uh, to remind you, so the, the, the claim is that uh, in, in two dimensions at a quantum critical point, the optical connectivity should be spe spectrally flat, and uh, so there we're after this universal constant uh, sigma infinity here. Okay, so, so we have a theory of direct fermions coupled to uh, uh, complex scalars. So first of all, let's imagine we ignore the scalars and just ask what if we have just direct fermions? Okay, what is the optical connectivity? So, so, um, so free direct fermions, if the chemical potential is at the direct point, in fact, is a critical theory in a sense because it's scale invariant, so it's a free, Dirac uh, conformal field theory, um, and if you calculate this, um, this uh, connectivity, it's a simple you know, single particle calculation, and you would obtain uh, uh, essentially uh, for per Dirac fermion, you should obtain one, uh, one sixteenth, um, and if you have a system like graphene that has four Dirac fermions, uh, then uh, the, this uh, sigma infinity should be one fourth. If you convert this to a uh, connectivity in physical units, you should find this pi e squared over 2h, and the nice thing is that actually this has been measured. So if you uh, um, measure this optical connectivity uh, uh, as a function of uh, photon frequency, uh, so here this measurement is done between you know, 0.5 and 1.2 eV, and if you look at the temperature at which they've done these measurements, then this ratio is 39, which is quite large. Okay, so in a sense, it sort of confirms the expectation that, okay, this is not, not perfectly flat, but it's roughly spectrally flat, so that essentially confirms this idea that if you have scale invariance, then you have a, uh, a uh, spectrally flat uh, optical connectivity. Okay, so of course, uh, but this is without interaction, so this result does not apply in our case uh, because we have strongly interacting Dirac fermions and Cooper pairs, and so it's a difficult problem, uh, and uh, you know, how can we deal with this? Okay, so it turns out that, I won't go into the details because things get a bit complicated, but it turns out that very much like we could use uh, supersymmetry to compute the critical exponents, the anomalous dimensions exactly, it turns out that actually you can compute this optical connectivity uh, uh, exactly at the critical point using supersymmetry, uh, even though it's a strongly coupled theory. Okay? And, um, so again, I won't go into the details, but uh, the idea is that you can use the properties of supersymmetry that tell you that the, the U1 uh, current, uh, uh, you know, essentially the current that goes into the Kubo formula for this optical connectivity, it belongs to the same representation of supersymmetry as the stress tensor, and the correlation function of the stress tensor, you can compute this uh, in these n equal two theories uh, uh, using a, a technique called localization. Okay, so essentially, uh, uh, roughly speaking, the idea is that these n equal two supersymmetric theories are one loop exact. So if you do a one loop calculation for the partition function, you get the exact result. Again, okay, this allows us to get the uh, optical connectivity exactly. Okay, so uh, it turns out that you can also uh, extract other properties exactly, such as 
uh, uh, the, what we call the dynamical uh, shear viscosity, which is a frequency dependent uh, viscosity. Uh, and there's a related quantity. Sur surprisingly, it turns out to be related, uh, which is the entanglement entropy of a region with a corner. Okay, and uh, the angular dependence uh, can be uh, related to this, uh, this coefficient of the two-point function of the stress tensor, which, which can also be computed exactly. Okay, so just to summarize this part, essentially, uh, we can obtain exact results uh, uh, for dynamical response properties of a strongly correlated uh, uh, problem in two plus one dimension. All right, so uh, in the remaining uh, few minutes, uh, what I'll talk about is essentially uh, looking at the next possible case. So I, I, I told you about the case with a single direct fermion on the surface. Um, and since we have to have an odd number of direct fermions, the next case would be three direct fermions. Okay, and what I'll argue is that there's some uh, uh, similar, but uh, still conceptually uh, uh, new physics uh, there also. Okay, so first of all, how would we get three direct fermions? Um, so if you took, for instance, the 111 surface of a cubic crystal, uh, then uh, you know, generically, this has a C3V symmetry. And if you look at a Brillouin zone, a planar a surface Brillouin zone with a system for a system with uh, C3, C3V point group symmetry, then there are four time reversal invariant momenta. There's the gamma point, uh, and there's also three M points uh, in this case. Okay, and these three M points are related by C3 rotations. And uh, so if your direct cone is not at the gamma point, if it's at the M point, then you will have three uh, degenerate direct cones at these M points. Okay, and so in fact, it was shown in, in first principle calculations, uh, uh, including work by uh, uh, Matthias Voita here, that if you look at the 111 surface of antimony, uh, samarium hexaboride, okay, which is not the one that is usually studied, which is a 001 surface, but somehow if you're able to cut, uh, cleave the crystal and cut the crystal at uh, this 111 surface, then the prediction is that you should find uh, uh, three degenerate direct cones at the endpoints. Okay, so on the 001 surface, you have three direct cones, but they're not degenerate. They're not all the same energy. Uh, but in this case, they, are, uh, they would be at the same energy. Okay, and, and uh, uh, also some, some uh, reports here that maybe in antimony, uh, sorry, ytterbium hexaboride, although in experiment, it, this seems to be uh, contradicted by experiment. Um, so in any case, so, you know, there are possible platforms that would give you three degenerate uh, direct cones. And what uh, we want to do is to look at what are the possible superconducting instabilities of now a system with uh, three uh, degenerate Dirac cones. Okay, so once again, we'll consider that the chemical potential is at the Dirac point. So we have the same problem of a vanishing density of states. So there is a quantum critical point from a, a semi-metallic system with three Dirac cones to a superconducting state. So the question is, what type of superconducting states can we get? Okay, so uh, there are two possibilities. So we can either get uh, intravalley or intervalley pairing. So if we have pairing uh, between fermions at the same valley, then it turns out that uh, this is basically uniform superconductivity. It has zero uh, net crystal momentum. So this would be a uniform superconductor. And the other possibility is to have intervalley pairing. So we would have uh, essentially uh, a direct fermions pairing between uh, two different cones. Uh, and if you look at the momentum carried by the Cooper pair, the center of mass momentum carried by the Cooper pair, in this case, it's non-zero. Okay, so we would have, there's three possible pairing order parameters, essentially the three cyclic permutations of sine one singlet, singlet pairing between sine one and sine two, and these have three uh, different momentum vectors given by Q1, Q2, Q3. And what this means is that this corresponds to a pair density wave state where the Cooper pair has non-zero uh, center of mass momentum. Okay, um, so, Likewise, we can try to do a, uh, a Lana Ginsburg theory for this. Uh, so we'll focus on the pair density weave case, which uh, 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 the other case essentially reduces to the previous problem. So now if we look at a, uh, the theory of these three coupled order parameters, uh, we can write down a Lana theory just based on the symmetries. Uh, so it turns out there is, uh, you know, there's the usual quadratic term, but now there's three uh, distinct uh, quartic terms allowed by uh, the symmetry. So the point group symmetry, uh, uh, particle number conservation, time reversal, and, and translation symmetry. And so in the first case, if we do uh, mean field theory, then we can uh, forget about these Leggett modes that are gapped. And at the mean field level, essentially, we only have to consider this Lena Ginsburg uh, uh, potential. Okay, so if we do mean field theory, uh, so first of all, if we consider that this coupling is positive, then uh, uh, this is the phase diagram. So if R is greater than zero, you have the uh, disordered phase. If R is less than zero, you have the pair density wave, wave phase. But it turns out you have two separate phases uh, separated by a first order transition. Okay, so, um, so essentially if U1 is positive, uh, 
And then this term uh, makes the order of parameters repel each other, so it, it's more favorable to make uh, two of them vanish and only one of them non-zero. So it turns out that this actually breaks a rotation symmetry. So we call this the pneumatic uh, paradensity wave state. Uh, and if U1 is negative, then this wants to make all the order parameters condense simultaneously. And then we have an isotropic paradensity wave where everything is gapped and the three order parameters are equal to each other. Okay, so, so that was for U2 greater than zero. If U2 is less than zero, then uh, to stabilize the free energy, we need to add a sixth order term. Uh, and uh, okay, so this means that uh, if we add this six order term uh, and uh, U2 becomes negative, then in fact, uh, this is very much like the, uh, the phi six theory, so the tricritical Ising model. So uh, the transition goes from second order to first order at a tricritical line here. Okay. Um, and so now if we have a tricritical line, we need to uh, ask about critical properties here. So if we do a renormalization group analysis uh, of this tricritical line, uh, it turns out that there's uh, interesting physics that shows up. So uh, uh, first of all, we have emergent Lorentz invariance, as in the previous case. Uh, and uh, it turns out that there's a single uh, stable fixed point uh, that is characterized by this, uh, this theory. So we have a non-zero uh, sort of Yukawa coupling and a non-zero coupling between sort of off-diagonal coupling between the order parameters. And it turns out that this theory actually is also supersymmetric. Um, but it's a different theory. It's not the Vesumino model. It's the so-called XYZ model, nothing to do with the XYZ model of magnetism, uh, in which essentially the Cooper pair and the direct fermion are, are on each cone or super partners, but they all interact strongly via this uh, uh, XYZ so-called uh, uh, super potential. Okay, and I'll, I'll finish on this. So the interesting uh, thing about this theory is that actually it has a dual description in terms of uh, so-called supersymmetric quantum electrodynamics. Okay, so this is this duality is, is known as mirror symmetry. So again, nothing to do with the usual mirror symmetry in kinetic matter physics, but it's really a, a, a sort of a supersymmetric version of the usual particle vortex duality. Okay, so the usual duality, we have a duality between boson and Cooper pairs and uh, uh, vortices and photons in, in a gauge theory. And likewise, the vortices on the matter side are mapped to charged bosonic matter on the gauge side. Uh, in this uh, uh, supersymmetric duality, we have the same thing, but now we have uh, also a duality that maps the direct fermions to a fermionic excitation of the gauge field, okay, the so-called Fotino. And likewise, we have uh, uh, a charge uh, uh, matter, charge under this gauge field here, but both fermionic and bosonic matter. Okay, so I think I'm basically at the end. So, uh, so I'll briefly summarize here. So at charge neutrality, uh, I argue that uh, the surface of 3D topological slitters can exhibit a semi-metal superconductor critical point, which is a different universality class from the bosonic uh, problem, the 3D XY problem. If we have one or three direct cones, then uh, we have emergent supersymmetry of different types, uh, either the Vesumino type or the uh, XYZ type, which is dual to supersymmetric QED. And supersymmetry is very powerful in this case because it allows you to determine exactly certain dynamical response properties of, of a strongly correlated uh, critical point in more than one dimension. Okay, so I'll stop here and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.